everybody. I'm Emily Boyer, co-host and producer of Off Planet Radio, and now co-host of the show you're about to watch, Words with Danny. And Randy have, uh, and I have been working hard for a long, uh, quite a while to expand the Off Planet Media platform and bring you different shows, different concepts and ideas. And um, so right now, I'm introduced to you the newest member of the Off Planet family. You guys have seen her on our show before, Danny Katz, the host of her, and this is her show, Words <laughs> with Danny. So um, I, I know I actually have been, there's been people requesting when is this coming because we've talked about it for so long. So we've been perfecting it and <laughs> oh, I think we've got it this time. So um, <laughs> Danny, welcome to the fam. Yeah, we're really happy to have you. Um, the, our, 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 our group and our uh, listeners really enjoy your input, even the people, even the people who disagree enjoy your input. <laughs> so yeah. we're really happy to have you and welcome aboard. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, so we are going to um, kind of the, the route we've decided to go with this show is just sort of let everybody listen to one of our sort of standard conversations. And usually these happen at Danny's apartment on her couch, but for, for, for now, we're going to do it this way because she and I are both super duper, <laughs> super duper busy. So um, I think we wanted to get into some of the topics that are going on a little bit in the more mainstream media and then also in like that space between sort of mainstream and alternative. Some of the um, stuff that's being discussed, some of the arguments that are being had and whatnot. So um, why don't you tell us sort of where we're going to start here? And as always, our conversations will end up someplace probably far from where we started. I <laughs> hope you'll enjoy. So, Yeah, well, the inspiration for, the, for this one, this 11th hour, let's do it now, was <laughs> the, um, the New York Times Jordan Peterson article and some more sort of like mainstream attention slash pushback that he's gotten and is getting and now that they've named the intellectual dark web and um, just sort of th these more fringy voices and characters getting into the mainstream more and seeing the mainstream freak out and have these weird reactions um, had me thinking that let's talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So let's, um, you made a video about the New York Times article that you're talking about. Do you want to give people like a little, just in case anyone hasn't seen that, um, that a little bit of breakdown of like what happened with that news, that, that article, what you think was going on there and why you found it so disturbing? Yeah. So um, what inspired me to speak to that article was was sort of different where, where we're gonna go now, but it was, I, I just couldn't believe the New York Times would run something that totally egregious, so reckless, so factually and intellectually incorrect and with such a clear and obvious editorialized agenda. It was super appalling to me. So that video is breaking down the ways that the journalists misunderstood a lot of Peterson's perspectives, the ones that she chose to talk about, um, and I do want to get into that where I see his ideas getting most maligned. Um, but then how she took those misunderstandings and kind of angled it to make it seem that George, that Peterson has this anti-woman bent and then just kept angling um, the article through like weird opinion and agenda. So I used the the article as a way to sort of break down the media machine and the propaganda machine and how at this point the like allegedly free mainstream press is really fucking with the public. Um, but since then I've seen, there was the interview that you sent me today. It was someone, Scott. Uh, it was, it was a British guy on BBC. I forget, I forget his name. I, right. Uh, and so what I'm seeing as like the, the main primary breakdown in Peterson's ideas and, and they're like you and I've talked about there are lots of issues I have plenty of issues I don't I, I especially take issue with the way that he frames his ideas it's a very sort of authoritarian old school lens um, and his insistence that people should be married and his languaging and all that but, but the main thing that I saw in this article and that I saw in the interview that you sent to me today is that when he talks about masculine feminine energetics um, which is a concept that you can find in the Tao in the Rig Veda in the Upanishads in the Bhagavad Gita in like a zillion mystical traditions and metaphysical traditions that people are hearing that and conflating masculine and feminine energetics with dudes and chicks. And so 
when Peterson says the feminine principle is chaos, which is like a Taoist principle, people are taking that to mean women are chaos and then freaking out from this completely like shallow reductive perspective um, and then s spinning his word to be misogynistic based on that like really off like intellectual lightweight lens. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I agree. That is what is happening with him on almost every topic is that like people are not understanding, you know, whether you agree with him or disagree with him, there is a very good chain of logic in all of the things that he says. You can understand yeah. where he's coming from and you can actually have a reasonable conversation with him. And that's not what anyone is looking to do. They're looking to um, otherize him and to confuse people about who he is and what he means and what he stands for and what not. No, and I agree with you. I mean, that is, you know, that's an age old idea that, you know, the, the feminine energy is an energy of chaos and the, you know what I mean? Or, or whatever. And the masculine energy is an energy of order. It doesn't, and people are, smart people are intentionally mis, misconceiving, you know, mistaking that and saying, he's saying that women are crazy and people who do, aren't as smart or who don't know as much about this kind of stuff are believing that, are listening to that. And everybody's getting outraged and up in arms over something that is not actually what he's saying. It, exactly. And that seems to be like the fundamental mainstream breakdown that I'm seeing in this moment. What's unfortunate is that I don't see him adjusting that. Like I, I'm, I'm not really clear why he's not making that correction because I think it would go a long way in his work being swallowed. Um, but I think the other thing with, with Peterson's languaging, specifically more so than anyone in the intellectual dark web, which is I know some, something that you wanted to talk about and we haven't even touched on that and I'm excited to go there, but like is um, his languaging is so masculine and I know a lot of people are taking issue with he, him and the intellectual dark web being anti-feminist which I don't see, that's not, that's not their intention, right? They're speaking to truths. If those truths rub up against some weird like neo-feminist ideologies, that's incidental to scientific truth. Um, but what's unfortunate is that his languaging is so authoritarian and, and masculine that it makes it hard to hear him. So there's a lot of like right, wrong, and you should, and this sort of wielding of his intellect in a way that's sort of violent and causes a lot of unnecessary pushback. Obviously on some level he's feeding off of it, which is great for that, that crack in his ego that's feeding off of it, but it's making it really hard, like that much harder for people to hear him. I, I, I agree with you on a certain level. I think part of the reason he's done this is because um, you know, now he has a whole intellectual dark web around him. But when this first started with him a year and a half ago about the gender pronouns and stuff, right? He was kind of out there by himself. And I think he got really, um, he decided that like, I'm going to be just really like, I'm going to say what I think and I'm not going to move from that. You know what I mean? And, and, and I think that was actually the position that he had to take for that issue. But because he sort of developed this, um, uh, report how he interacts with the the public at large and the the mainstream media or the media that sort of opposes him and wants to characterize him as something is not he it has become a confrontational energy and so that's how it always is and that is why he feels like he has to be very authoritarian with what he's saying because he's watched other people who he knows had a good point cave under the pressure of you know the left-leaning media and act and start to not stand so firmly in what they believe and so i think it's gone really far like i think he's yeah yeah, I totally agree. And I think it's kind of one of the downsides of this naming it the intellectual dark web. And I'm, I'm even seeing it in like, you know, we talked about the Candace Owens, Joe Rogan interview and um, seeing her now that she's aligned with more conservative voices and she's more allied with, you mm -hmm. know, the Shapiros and those people and seeing her take on some of their ideas as her own and getting watered down. And I think it's sort of the downside of these outliers and these sort of like outsiders being part of a tribe now, which I can understand on an in individual level, how that must be so like 
healing and lovely and heartwarming, but at the same time, I'm seeing it do their individual messages a disservice as they become more watered down to fit into their de facto tribe. Have you noticed how she also is starting to dress more like a politician and stuff like that? She looks kind of, like, have you seen the Candace, like when she goes on like Fox News, she's wearing oh, yeah. like the navy blue suits and she's got like the hair that is like politician hair. And I liked her better I mean, the way she was when she was a little raw, yeah. I, I did too, but it's kind yeah. of what, you know, it's, it always happens. It's like, do you remember yeah. those two little Swedish girls who were like singing their cover song in flannel in the forest and then like <laughs> some rock star, you know, development exec discovered them and now they're all like polished and lame. It's the same thing. Right. And like, no question she's, she's being groomed for politics like she's right. she's the rights wet dream like i i don't blame them and i don't blame her like fine become a politician like it's totally fine but it's just a bummer seeing yeah. uh, seeing all of these people kind of lose their individual sparkle and whatever it was as they become more watered down and I, like i said i don't blame them but i'm a little concerned yeah. about the that now they're becoming their own tribe and it goes back to that like yeah group mind issue yeah the other thing I think about the thing with Jordan Peterson, and I think this was the point of some of your stuff about that New York Times article, was that there was actually no useful content in the article. Like when you sent me the article, like I, I'll be like I made a post about it. Like yeah, I linked to your video, and I made a post. It was actually unreadable for me because it gave me a headache because they're basically, you know. They're talking about, they're supposed to be talking about his book, 12 Rules for Life, an Antidote to Chaos. But the way that the article was constructed and just the, like, it, it, the, it, the article created chaos in, the, in like the mind of the person trying to read it. And it was, sure. it, it was unreadable to me. And it was, the, but it was, you could feel that there was like intentional polarization being created. Like they'd whip something up, pull it over to this pole on the right, whip something up, pull it over here, and then send the reader's head spinning like back and forth and, and whatever. And it just became unreadable to me. And I was just like, you know, this is crazy because anybody who reads this article, regardless of what they think of Jordan Peterson, is going to feel, a, have a headache and feel in chaos when they're done reading it. And so like then, so ob that's obviously to like make him look like he's actually the one creating the chaos, not trying to solve anything about chaos on a certain level. So there's that, but it also like, I've been following Jordan Peterson for at least a year and a half. I've looked at a lot of his stuff. Um, nothing that was said in, the, in that article actually represents anything about what is true about him. And so, you know what I mean? Like if, if you, this takes only a really small amount of research to understand like, what his point of view on things is, whether you agree with him or not, is not the issue. But oh, yeah. Like, this no, was, that was a hit job. That was yeah. like, it wasn't even trying to be a balanced article. That was what was so troubling. And it wasn't done gracefully or deftly or intelligently. Right. Like, it was like a 10th grader's shitty half ass C minus yeah. book report where he clearly didn't read the book. Like, it was so shallow. It was so off. And what was weird because I like, I don't read the New York Times because I know it's a piece of shit, was that I saw this weird anti-Peterson pushback on Facebook. And I'm like, where is this coming from? And they're all parroting versions of the same nonsense. And when I pressed any of them for like, where are you getting your information? What do you think about this? It was just like repeating the same rhetoric, but the, it had no interest. And, and then I realized like, oh, it's the programming coming from this article. And that's kind of the same thing as the Michelle Obama video that we'll like get there in a minute. Yeah. disgusts me. But, but what I'm saying is it's the programming. And so yeah. now when we talk to people from the left who all they know of Jordan Peterson is what they read from the New York Times article. They think they now, know shit about him. Right, but, but, yeah. but because of the way that was language, there's some sort of programming going on where mm -hmm. like there's also no reasoning with, with them. Yeah. Like it's, and I don't want to do an us them thing, but like that, that's how it's working. That's how that, that propaganda machine is working. That was the gist of, of that video was breaking that down. Also, so many of the people that are commenting on Jordan Peterson now have actually never looked at any of his work. They've only listened to people comment on his work right. Right? and they've made their decision about him based on that and whatever. And what, whatever somebody thinks of Jordan Peterson is actually irrelevant, but this is actually what's happening with everything. Right, like people, people exactly. don't actually know anything, and no. they form their opinions of things based on the breakdown of it by someone who has an agenda and also pretty much also doesn't actually know anything. <laughs> Completely. 
Completely. <laughs> like, what happened with the pussy hat thing? Like, it's, right. it's, it's the same thing. So now it becomes this, like, truncated meme, and, and it, it's, it's super frustrating because then these people, what's weird is, like, the vir virulence with which people are clinging to these ideas about Peterson still not having <laughs> any actual experience of his work. Right. And, and, and that, that sort of is what's happening with every, it's this polarization, this whole thing like designed to divide with nobody actually really knowing or anything, or the people who actually do know something push so far over here in the corner and have so many names sort of built up in the pile of stuff that's against them. that The people over here now not only hate Peterson, but the people who like, anyone who likes Peterson is in that, yeah. Right, um, they're selling out their sex. And then, so this goes in, right, right. There's, they're selling out their sex or they're selling, you know, or they're, they're, they're racists now, or they're in the alt-right or the whatever. I mean, and that's the whole, um, they, it's like they're doing, you know, they did a good, they've done a good job of trying to paint him as like, um, you know, an alt-writer. And then now this article, I think they called him the custodian of the patriarchy. And I was just like, yeah. I've listened to hours and hours and hours of Jordan, Jordan Peterson, and I've never gotten that from him. I've gotten, <laughs> I've gotten that there's, there are differences between men and women, and that might explain why men end up in certain places of, of certain positions and women in others, but he's never suggested that that's because women, or men are smarter or women shouldn't do it or anything like that. No, not at yeah. all. And in that same sentence where they described him as the custodian of the patriarchy, they said working with a group of people working to undermine liberal but, efforts at equal rights, which was so interesting to see. Yeah. That's such a, a leap in journalistic ethics to attribute intention mm -hmm. that's completely, completely fabricated, which is exactly what Michelle Obama did. I know we're bookmarking that. Well, yeah, yeah. How that's become totally fair game for mainstream news to ascribe intentions mm -hmm. completely egregiously, completely wrong to make them up because the left has somehow framed themselves as front and center of any story happening on planet earth and so they have to take all of jordan peterson's work and the entire intellectual dark web's work is to undo the things that they care so much about right. even though it has nothing to do with it's weird this crazy narcissism program that has infected the left i i find it appalling yeah no I mean, it, it, it is appalling and also like it is you know they ascribe an intent that it it, it like and isn't like just feeling like you can do that whether the intent you're ascribing is anywhere near accurate for what what it may or may not be or not is is bad enough but the other thing is is like what they're real like i would have you know the, the the truth is is the difference between someone like peterson and these people on the left they actually um both are trying to i think they think they're both trying to make things better uh, in their own crazy mind. But one side, and I think this is the point that like they never want to talk about or never want highlighted because it shows sort of the um, asininity of some of what the people on the left are saying is that Jordan Peterson and people that fall, you know, that sort of are in more in line with his ideas are more interested in equality of opportunity. And these people over here are interested in equality of outcome. And I agree with Jordan Peterson. That's actually a really dangerous road to go down, yeah. to have that be the, the thing that we're, that we're shooting for, because then there's no reason for anybody to strive or to work hard for anything or to do, or to, or to even do anything different or more or whatever. Um, but like, it would be one thing to say that it would be, you know, I still might not agree, but it would be fair to say that like, we think that equality of, of opportunity is not, good enough or we think that's wrong right but they know that that's not even like that's a ridiculous sounding argument so instead they ascribe this intention to him that is completely ridiculous to anybody who would look but then of course nobody looks and so like it just it, it, we get to the point where like you can't like we're so many steps out from a conversation about what the issues actually are that that's the thing is like we're not even talking about the issues anymore and that's what i'm seeing like the pushback to peterson is not about what he's talking about the pushback yeah. to my analysis of peterson is not what i'm talking about right. nor is it what he's talking about the one place where i disagree with you is i don't think the left understands what the conversation really is i don't think it's a de deliberate tactic to take the conversation away i think that they don't freaking get it because as far as i'm concerned like you said um 
if we're vying for equality of outcome, which is impossible in this, the way this reality is structured, that's not how nature works, um, then that demands a tyrannical police state yeah. to police everything we do. I don't think there's a more important conversation right now mm -hmm. than to not <laughs> succumb to a tyrannical police state, which the left does not realize is where they're taking us at yes. warp speed. And that's what's so frustrating is they don't understand, you know, from my perspective, I don't think they understand what's really going on. I don't think they understand how they're diverting the conversation because they're being so played by a propaganda machine that is feeding off of their unresolved and unintegrated trauma. So that keeps getting triggered mm -hmm. so much that, that now we're dealing with people who are in an emotional trauma state, which means we're dealing with children. We're not dealing with adults. They're mm -hmm. not capable of having this conversation. So I, 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 agree, I agree with you that most of the people who are on the receiving end of the information of the New York Times are not conscious that they're doing it. But I, 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 like, I, I, I have a hard time believing that the per person who wrote the New York Times article didn't do that with the intention of doing exactly what she did. Oh, uh, see, I, it's so funny. It's interesting because I had this, Randy and I had this exact same breakdown the last time I was on your show is, um, I totally disagree. I do not think that that journalist was smart enough to understand what he was talking about. And I think the New York Times editors right now are happy to have stupid journalists. Yeah, okay, so it's really so, half-assed so, reductive jobs. Like they're their little minions. But, so but, okay, so the, programming for them. But so I don't maybe, think that writer got it. So maybe the more important. Okay, so I and I can buy that on a certain level. But the person at the New York Times that hired her definitely knew that. Yeah, we can get this one to push this agenda. Like the there are people in positions of power that know what they're doing that are somewhere between allowing this to happen and making this happen. Yeah, there must be. Like, obviously, I'm not in a New York Times newsroom, so I can't. Yeah, that's my guess as well. Yeah. I have no idea. But, but the pieces that we're bookmarking and sort of the, the lines that I drew when we were on the phone earlier today, yes, I absolutely think this is being engineered on some level, but I don't think that journalist got it. And I don't think that whoever interviewed Peterson today and was freaking out about everything he wrote, but I don't think he got it either. And I think that's what's really unfortunate is there are a lot of lightweights who are not resourced enough intellectually to be analyzing these conversations. They don't even get them. Yeah. So the la just the last thing I want to say real quick about this Peterson thing, and then we can move on to the Michelle Obama <laughs> issue and thing, um, is that to be fair that there, uh, and I was actually just reading it before we got started and I didn't have a chance to finish it because I've been so busy and I'm woefully behind in catching up on everything I'm supposed to be doing. Hell yeah. But to be yeah. fair, the, Los Angeles, like to be fair, to, it's not the New York Times, so it's not, they weren't doing it, but there was actually a decent article in the, in the LA Times. I Time loved the LA Times article. article. Uh, yeah. Oh my God. It was like, it restored so much faith in journalism in Los Angeles. Like, okay, someone gets this. I didn't think it was perfect, but well, it was. It wasn't perfect and it wasn't, so it, there was an article by a woman who also writes for Reason Magazine, which is a little bit more libertarian leading magazine, but the LA Times gave her a fairly big article to write about Jordan Peterson and her point, and which again, I, with you, I didn't, I didn't read, didn't, I scammed through the whole article, I didn't get into all the details, but she disagrees with him on some stuff too, but she's basic, but other stuff she agrees and she's basically saying that feminists rather than like being disgusted by Peterson and not paying attention would be smart to pay attention to him because some of the points he's bringing up about this divide are very fair and the actions that they are taking are creating these people who are liking what Jordan what Peterson is saying and following him and, you know what I mean and it, you know like basically that unless feminists are going to take the time to actually understand what it is that Jordan Peterson is saying they're going to continue to be sort of this participating in creation of this divide. Yeah, she made some really smart points on where like first wave feminism really did do men a disservice. And that's where the neo-feminists who are taking issue with Peterson right now and who have this vested interest in women being the most marginalized group on the planet, unless you're a woman of color or unless you're a trans woman of color with a fucking <laughs> fake leg. Do you know what, like whatever this, let's fight over who's more The smart. oppression Olympics, yeah. Totally. Yeah. But, 
But she was pointing out where first wave feminism really did do men a disservice and how, okay, if men and women are equal and there are no gender differences, then how come if a man gets drunk and hooks up with a woman, it's rape and it's 100% on him, where if she's drunk, there's no culpability. And there were all of these things. I mean, you've probably heard me say, like, just to have an entire generation of men grow up, with the bumper sticker, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle, like that is going to infect a young developing psyche in the same way that the future is feminine tells every little boy who sees that shirt that mm -hmm. the future doesn't have a place for him. So there are like, so she went over that, she didn't go over the last one, but she went over a lot of those ways mm -hmm. um, that first wave fem feminism has done men a disservice. And in my experience as a woman on this planet, I, that, that is my experience. I do feel like, men have gotten short shrift in the same way, you know, like, and there are other ways that women have got short shrift. Like we've all gotten short shrift. And I feel like that's kind of the conversation right now is like, yeah. we're all traumatized. We're all fucked. We all have shadows. Like, can we stop competing over who has more and just heal yeah. our wounds and move forward? Like the left yeah. with their no fucking vision of anything better and just whining about the election that happened years ago is so crazy. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it is. It, it is crazy, and it is um, the, the only reason I can see that people would do that is they don't actually have any ideas for anything moving forward. You know what I mean? Like they don't actually have. It's ha easier to complain and whine and be yeah. a marginalized victim. It's so much harder to like take responsibility, get creative and proactive, and come up with a vision. But everyone, I mean, a lot of people on the left seem to have way more of a vested if interest in whining. Yeah. You know, I also just want to say real quick, I never saw those futurist feminine shirts until you started talking about them. And now I see oh, them. Now I've seen them everywhere. But w just quickly on a little aside here, another great video you did that you reposted was something you had did like, done like a year ago about unidentifying. And like, oh, yeah. that's something um, people, if you haven't seen that, check out her video. It's on both her Facebook page and on my Facebook page. Um, and that's something. So I've been, uh, even my, like, I don't like identity politics. I've never liked it and whatever. And I've been very um, clear on not being engaged in any of that for a long time. But I just myself personally went through a phase where I've identif unidentified with certain ways that I was identifying myself. And I wasn't even identifying myself that way because I felt that way. I was doing it to make it, things easier for other people to understand about me. And I, like, I decided to stop doing it. It was actually quite freeing. But I was in the market yesterday, I was in Whole Foods yesterday, and this girl came, walked by and she was like in a rush or whatever, and she had a shirt on that said like vegan feminist or feminist vegan or whatever, right? And I was like, stop doing that. Because uh, like my initial, my initial um, feeling was, Ugh, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but maybe like it, just doing that is like cutting herself off from other people in a way that is like, Maybe this per maybe she's a vegan feminist, but like maybe she's also like super into gymnastics or super into something else I'm into. Uh, you know what I mean? And we could have a conversation about that, but I'll never know that because she's wearing a shirt that says feminist vegan. Uh, you know what I mean? That is just like right. But that's <sighs> I mean that's sort of the human look. Humans identify if we're if that's the name of the awakening game is to like find the identifications which are all boxes and cages and unravel ourselves mm -hmm. from their grips and liberate ourselves and we're all doing it all you know like we all have things we're identified or we would be freaking buddhas so yeah i hear what you're saying she's choosing like that's where she's most identified she wants you to know and everyone at whole foods to know that she's a vegan and she's a feminist because her identity is kind of fragile and her self-esteem isn't like fully developed and she's getting yeah. some sort of juice about that. Like that, that's fine. We all have, we all have those. They're just play. We need to outgrow those. Yeah. Um, but, but we all have them and it's, it's like watching Candace Owens on Joe Rogan was interesting to see places where she's identified and where that, you know, is sort of like, curving, distorting her view. Like she comes from a very unidentified place when she's sharing her political views or her analysis, but then she's talking about the importance of family and the importance of religion. And these are pillars or hallmarks in her household growing up. And it's like, yes, those are, those helped you form your personal identity. And that's so much of this riff that we're seeing is people conflating their own personal identity with how it should be for the rest of the world. And people not understanding like, okay, that's how it was for you. And that was a priority that you were inculcated with in your family structure. And other people might have different priorities based on their inculcation. Do you know what I'm saying? 
But it's like, we can't see beyond our identity because that's, you know, it's like the fish talking about the water we're in. And the more work we do on ourselves and the more we unravel those pieces, <laughs> hopefully, but everyone has them. Does I guess I said, yeah, yeah, no, I just, like, I guess, and just maybe this is just me being where I'm at right now. Like, what, like, this need people have, and I think, I feel like this is being pushed by, you know, power controlling entities or, you know, forces on the left, but also forces on the right. Like, it has become trendy or stylish to be identified with this, 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 and that, right? They're like, they've made like a whole kind of culture around it in a way that it didn't feel so much to me like that, like in the 90s or in the 80s or whatever, right? And I, like, I, to me, it's just like, how about just be you? Like, you be Danny, I'll be Emily and whatever. And like, you can like feminism, you can eat a vegan diet, you can whatever, but not use that as something to sort of like identify yourself because that, that makes the, like that just, just the t-shirt makes the possibility of a conversation difficult and less. Maybe. I mean, I, I hear everything you're saying. It makes conversations easier with other vegan feminists. Right. It makes conversations more challenging with omnivores or people who I don't identify as feminists. It's just, however, she, you know, is she a provocateur? Is this how she wants to go around the world? Like, we're all at different levels of consciousness. Um, that's the level she's at. As far as yeah. why is there yeah. more of it now? Because we're a crazy consumer culture that's yeah. gone fucking batshit. So if there's a t-shirt for like <laughs> Aquarius dykes with peg legs, then someone's <laughs> going to put that out and grab that niche and make that green off of that particular subgroup. Like that's all what's driving the economy, which is what's driving this whole fucking sham. But uh, the other thing is, is it says in the Dow that something um, before things go away, before attributes go away, they get bigger. So mm. obviously, like on, on some macro level of this conversation, we're shifting from a 3D dualistic reality to some more 5D, God knows what it is, right? Like you and I grew up with like binary genders. There are dudes <coughs> and six, and that's kind of it. Now it's a whole different ballgame. So clearly we're mutating into something different, which means evolving beyond identity. So Yes. Part of what I think I hear you saying is like, it's getting bigger, like the way all of our human shadows are getting bigger because the species is going through so something major. I don't know what it is. Is it going to be a mass awakening? Is it a mass die off? Is it, you know, some like alien merging? I don't know, but I, I agree with you in that it's getting bigger, but it's also like everything is getting bigger and more garish. There, there are more of us. There are too many of us. Our narcissism is bigger. All of our human grossness, our emotional retardation and reactivity, like <laughs> it's just getting bigger and louder, the mess. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> sounds really, it sounds really appealing. Bigger, grosser, <laughs> more shadow. All right. So let's kind of like Spin, and we'll get to um, convers like we've brought up a couple of times Candace Owens and Joe Rogan. We're going to get to a conversation about that in a second. But let's move into this. You called me yesterday with sort of an interesting. Well, first of all, can talk a little bit about the post that you had on Facebook the other day about the, this Michelle Obama video. Talk a little bit about the video, and then talk about your post and the response. Like what was going on there with all that, and then we'll kind of uh, wind into sort of where this led you in terms of your conspiratorial oh, yeah, my new conspiracy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I, I first saw that video like a week and a half ago. Uh, maybe it was two weeks ago. And um, Can you tell people what the video was basically? Okay, so the video is Michelle Obama um, calling out other women, calling out the women who voted for Trump and basically shaming them and posing like, where have we gone awry as women that we could sell each other down the river by not voting for the woman candidate? And it was this weird sort of manipulation of like definitely pinpointing women who vote for Trump as A, the problem, and B, women who have issues with other women and women who can't support other women. So like the, the New York Times article, we see Michelle Obama totally making up a story as to why people voted for Trump and mm -hmm. deciding to, it, to make up a story that these women, the only way they could have voted for Trump is because they hate other women or have problems with other women. And I'm guessing, well, hold on, let me back up. So, so this was the video. 
And then I saw it reposted like 9,000 times. And you know, there's some people in your feed who you kind of expect to, and I'm sure you're like me, not a lot, but, but a few where you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're not like, for me, it's like, I'm not even going to go down that road. I know, I know that audience. I know that tribe, like whatever. But I saw a couple people who I respect and thought were more independent thinkers post it. And then I just got tired of posting the same comment. So I posted it on my own feed, which is that this is bullshit and it's so reckless um, and irresponsible to call for women to start hating on other women. Like A, to make up a story when she has no idea who people, like we all have a constitutional right to vote for whoever the fuck we want to vote for and we don't really have to explain ourselves to anyone. Um, if like. It's weird to me how the left has decided, decided that Trump voters are the problem. And it's weird for me to me that this is a story that they're clinging to years plural later. Like we don't have anything else to talk about. But it's so gross as far as like that sort of Hitler propaganda mentality of like, let's divide a nation by getting them to hate one another. It's like so transparent and gross. Right. So it was gross to see that. Um, and to her make up this story and like prey on women's like tender me too shit right now and to turn them against one another. And the thing is like, people voted differently for their own reasons. And it's weird. So I posted my post and the pushback that I got, which wasn't a lot, it was mostly support, but the pushback I got was notable in that the women said the same thing. They went right to voting for a sex offender is betrayal. And it was like, whoa. So I'm talking about, it's really irresponsible, irresponsible for Michelle Obama to ascribe unknown intention onto half the population and spin this story into like a really divisive story that separates us as women and as Americans. Like that's what I was talking about. So the, the pushback was all, Voting for a sex offender, sex offender is betrayal. Like I feel betrayed. And then, and then one of the women was like, you know, I'm a victim of sexual sexual abuse. And it was like, what the fuck does that have to do with what I'm talking about? So it was like weird to see what that triggered in women. Mm -hmm. And and it was consistent enough with the betrayal. Where I'm like, oh, obviously this this is a program. And I did go back and, and listen to the Michelle Obama video enough to see if that was like the exact wording. But I'm noticing that what's going on with the left and this knee jerk pushback, like it's programming, it's, it's mind control. And we get that from like seeing the repetition that we're seeing in the mainstream news. And like, just look at the Pizzagate thing and how like, there's like, there's no evidence. And like, they'll repeat the same thing. And it's like, there's, there's plenty of evidence, but anyone who sort of like wants to push back a, a, against that story will say the same things. Yeah. And it's the same thing here. And it's really scary because I'm noticing like, okay, whatever this program is, um, that's taking over the like critical thinking skills of the left is preying on some sort of sexual trauma button, right? Because that's what gets triggered and it goes to instant hysteria. And then it goes to anyone who voted for Trump, which could have been for 9 million reasons, policy, uh, you know, like economic conditions, vaccinate, like there are 9 million reasons but it automatically goes to like, you support sex offenders, well, you're selling women down the river, you, you, you know, don't respect my victimhood. It's also very, so a couple of things here. So it's, well, it's very interesting how like their, that which it makes their needs more important than anyone else's needs. So yeah. your need, right? Like, you know, so I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who's not really in, the, like she doesn't know not into any of the kind of information you or I are into or whatever she's like fairly normal person but she's smart and we got into a conversation about this and and you know she's an African-American woman right so like she you know like she um like maybe the, the left would assume that for her to even say this is betrayal now but she was like right. you know she's like I have a friend at work who like doesn't agree with Trump about almost anything but voted for him because he can't afford Obamacare he can't, and he keeps, he's having to pay, you know, th this much money a month for it and he can't afford it. And that was why he voted for it. So like these people who are like, my trauma, like to them that their trauma is, is like completely different, not, not like to them, like, um, matters more or is such a, you know, what it deserves to be, um, honored or respected more than what this person can actually afford to survive. Which kind of circles back to like, 
like I want to circle it back to Peterson and what he talks about. But before I go there, it's like I don't think one person voted for Trump because they think he's a sexual predator who gets off on fucking over women. Like I really, in in the nine trillion reasons that I'm sure people had, I don't think that that one was super popular. But it goes back to like this crazy narcissism where like, well, okay, I've never met you, but because you have unresolved sexual trauma, I need to adjust my vote, my priorities, my policy preferences accordingly. And that goes back to Peterson's thing, which is what I love about him, which is like, Take responsibility for your trauma Mm -hmm. and heal it. If you have sexual trauma, then you have responsibility to yourself, to your children, to your society, to your fellow women to heal that shit and Mm -hmm. get yourself whole. That's the name of the human game. We all have trauma and it's our responsibility to heal it. And what I'm noticing with this, the Me Too stuff and this Michelle stuff is they're like, So I'm talking about the irresponsibility of a leader spinning a story and then someone gets triggered and throws their sexual trauma into the conversation where it doesn't actually belong and isn't appropriate. And Mm -hmm. then I say, "Um, it's not super appropriate place for your trauma or to play the victim card. And then it's like, wow, you hurt my feelings. And it's like, well, you hurt your own feelings because if your trauma is still so tender that your feelings are hurt, a, don't be throwing it around in yeah. conversations on freaking social media with people you don't know. And B, go heal it so then we can have a conversation and like fix our country. And I see so much of what's going on is just like unresolved trauma. Yeah, there is. And we were talking about this a little bit in a totally different kind of context, but with our guest with Sonia Barrett last week about like this, people really need to needing to overcome this um like tendency to want to romance their victimhood, right? Like, you know what I mean? And, and, you know, it's unfortunate because actually there's some like people who would be really like some of the most powerful and and capable people of really challenging the things that need to be challenged if they could get out of that space because they they're smart they have abilities like you know they, you know what I mean like they they have something that they're they're really really good at and like they're they're not able to do that to the best extent of their the best best of their abilities because they're like they ha- they have to put half half of themselves like ha- half their time aside to like romance the constant need to let people know about their victimhood. Yeah, well, they're clinging to their victimhood and they're clinging to their trauma like a binky, and it's part of the reason why I love Candace Owens so much because that's her whole message to the black community is like let that shit go and empower yourself. Yeah. And I just want to call myself out right now because I just saw myself like mocking the sexual trauma, and and that's something that I do see the intellectual dark web totally misnamed as they are doing which is part of the problem so i want to call myself out because i don't allow that behavior and i don't i i don't think it's helpful but at the same time it does get super frustrating Mm -hmm. when we're wanting to have an intelligent conversation about the issues and then you have people bringing in their trauma and trying to bend the conversation around their trauma and it's really frustrating because it's like not the appropriate place. And it's, it's this like weird card that we're supposed to pander to. So I just want to call myself out because no, like, yeah. no, that, I, it's yeah. not the way to handle it. And, and there is a frustration. There's, you know, and this is, this is, we get into this constant back and forth of reactivity because of this, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And then the other thing is, and this is a slight aside, but it's also like, what kind of like mind control or weird thing is going on here where like the person is like, you know, the person that you're speaking of is talking about like, okay, but he's a sexual predator, right? But like also the person who she was saying was the preferable choice is also a sexual predator, right? Well, that, but we're not allowed to tell that story on right. any level. And that's what, I mean, the elephant in the room here is that big, dark, dirty secret in the DNC and the Clintons that we're not allowed to talk about because the second you mention it, you're a crazy conspiracy theorist and right. any any legitimacy to anything we're talking about goes out the window. But so it's, t- it's a tough one. And I, I said, cause you weighed in on the thread and I'm like, A, I totally agree. And B, I'm trying to keep people who are on the edge in this conversation. And that's such a swift way to get them out of the conversation. But yeah, it's fucking crazy that the Clintons are held up as this bastion of like sexual ethics. <laughs> like we can even completely, and, and I'm not saying we should, but, but, but we can, right? Completely push anything Pizzagate or whatever, or, or DNA 
agency emails related aside and go, wait a second, there's at least four or five or more women who have been settled with by Bill Clinton so they will go away and not talk about the sexual abuse he doled out on them. And Hillary Clinton is known to have attacked all of those women publicly. Those things are not conspiracies. Those things are in the mainstream news. And for some reason, we can't even talk about that. So but again, like this goes back to like, both you and I expecting people to engage these conversations with calm, rational, critical thinking. And this is the adjustment that we and everyone have to make is we're dealing with people who have lost control of whatever part of their brain is yeah. being hijacked by the propaganda. So that's what's so frustrating right now. And that's sort of the hack that I'm looking for. And that's why I've been posting so much more frequently, even though like, I feel the negative effects of being on social media. I feel the AI in my field, and yet I really feel the need to study where is this breakdown coming from? Because if this is a program, which I'm pretty 99% sure it is, yeah. then it can be hacked. We just yeah. have to figure yeah. out how well, it's it, operating. It feels, it feels like me, like one of the points to sort of set, center in on here is how is it that that you can be offended by one sexual predator, but not the other. Like how, where, that to me, that is like part because of the- Because the way the story is being spun, it's not right. being spun that the Clintons are, are sexual predators. Look, cl you look back on Clinton's presidency, what really happened and the pedestal he's put, it, put upon, you know, like he's the one who did for-profit prisons. He's the mm -hmm. one who broke the peace yep. treaty with North Korea. Like he's yep. the whole reason this whole North Korea thing yes. is going on. <laughs> You know, you have people praising the Obamas, but those stories, those programs, like, I don't know what it is with the left, how they're clinging so hard. And I think a lot of it has to do with they're not emotionally re or psychologically resourced enough to handle the amount of destabilization, destabilization that is coming when they realize the house of cards that they're clinging to and the extent of the lies, which is pointing to my new conspiracy theory. <laughs> All right, so, so let's, get, let, let, let's get into your, let's get, because you and I can go on and on and back and forth about this all day, but I do totally. think it would be interesting to identify the mind control that shields certain people from certain kinds of accusations and, and, and amplifies it for other people. Like, I do think that's kind of fascinating how, like, even the one other, the one person in your thread who was like, I'm not going to watch the video because I love the Obamas. Did right? you see, I pressed her on that. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> see that. But like, so me, I was like, well, that's fascinating. Something inside of her knows that if she watches this video, she might have a change of mind about the Obamas. So totally. she's not going to do that because that's a sacred cow in her mind. How did totally. that happen? Okay, so tell me what she said. But I think, but like, on one level, it's okay. Like, we, uh, this is such an intense time. Like, the onslaught of, like, disturbing information that we're taking in at warp speed. Like, it's okay to pendulate into it. Like, I trust me, she's going to get there. <laughs> like, but, but I also get it in, like, um, it, it's just so intense right now, what's going on. Um, and people want to believe that the powers that be have our best interests in mind. And I think the truth of it is too scary for a lot mm -hmm. of people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Her thing was, because I was like, why do you like the Obamas so much, given that, like, he deported more illegal aliens than any president. He bombed seven countries. He sent two million to Iranian terrorists. And, Signed the NDAA. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Standing Rock. I, I mean, like, yeah. whatever, whatever, whatever. But she likes them because they're personable. Um, they're diplomatic. Like she likes their style. It's the same right. reason why Nixon lost right. the debates when he lost the debate. Like it's not new, you yeah. know. They act presidential. They're good dancers. They're politically correct. You know, like it. They seem like the package. Um, okay, so here's my new conspiracy theory. Yes. Is that, um, so I do think what the program is playing on, a, a big piece of it that I'm seeing in this conversation is that sexual trauma. And, and you know the larger lay of the land as far as alters go, but I think they're, def I, I feel like there's a direct button that's being pushed right now. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So we saw under Obama's presidency, the whole Black Lives Matter uh, movement start, which I thought was really interesting of like, wow, we have a black president and this is the moment where- They got elected twice. They, they got, got elected, elected twice. twice. But race relations in this country have allegedly devolved to this yep. point that we're back to marching because of racism. Okay, I'm not seeing that in my own personal experience, but okay. But so, <laughs> so that program was laid, like black, Blacks in America are, are, you know, being really fucked over. Like, so going back to oppression Olympics, right? So we have that piece of it. Then we had 
Oprah's big, fat, dumb fucking speech at the Golden Globes where everyone was wearing the Time's Up right. um, things, which from a languaging perspective and a positioning perspective, the slogan that, that these actresses and multi-millionaire media moguls chose to adopt was not one of like unity and a future vision of a more like unified um, gender equal populace. It was fuck you oppressors, you're gonna get yours. So it was really regressive and backwards looking and punitive and patriarchal. Like again, like <laughs> wanting to continue to break down like where <laughs> patriarchy seeps in. So, so during that whole charade we have oprah and her speech where she literally calls for people to fight against this type of behavior so in her specific languaging she pretty much called for women to fight against the patriarchy to fight against the harvey weinstein's and the men who were you know behaving in this way which right. i also really like candace's point of view on this is like Shadows, human shadows exist. If we're gonna, if we're, if we're waiting till we perfect human behavior to move forward as a nation, like that's not ever gonna happen. Like male sexual shadows exist. That's a whole different conversation for another time. But so we had Oprah, a multi-billionaire, multimedia mogul, calling on the populace to fight. Right. So that's super divisive. If you're if you're calling on a populace to fight, then that populace needs an enemy to be able to obey that dictate. So then a few months later, we see Michelle Obama, uh, just after she signs, it might've been the same week that she signs this multi-million dollar, potentially billion, because they haven't, I don't think they released the actual number. With Netflix. You know, with Netflix. Right. Then we have her calling on women to start fighting with other women. And now this is the new enemy. Now women who voted for Trump are the new enemy. So we see these two, super powerful uh, multimedia millionaires who also happen to win the oppression Olympics in the way that this story has been fed to us in the past few years, calling on the populace for these various uh, fights and wars when the, the reality is, is that there's one enemy which is fucking corporate oligarchy. It's, it's this, this globalist agenda that they both represent. Yep. So, this is my overview of... Well, I can wind your conspiracy right back and make a complete ring of it that uh, Oprah is the person who introduced us all to Barack Obama. So Oprah introduced us to Barack Obama. Barack Obama, Obama whether it was his intention or, whether, or the, someone else's agenda or whatever, acted to incite racial tension in this country. Black Lives Matter was developed. To in, to, I don't even think it's to incite. To like lay out the narrative. Lay out right? the narrative, incite, agitate for, however you want to see it. DeRay McKesson from Black Lives Matter visited the White House very uh, an unreasonable number of times during Obama's presidency. You know what I mean? Black Lives yeah. Matter seems to have like largely run its course in terms of a lot of like public noise, but then you have this thing next came to Me Too and Oprah glommed on to the Me Too, right? Exactly. And the energy from that part of it has sort of settled sort of settled down. There wasn't quite as much noise about the last Me Too march as there was about the one before. Then you have Michelle Obama come with this. But now also, like I don't know what the hell's going on. Like all over my neighborhood right now, there's all these um don't vote for this guy because me too. Like the me too people are saying, don't vote for this guy. Cause he was it's like, I've never seen political signs like on this area of my neighborhood. And there's like postcards all over the floor with this kind of stuff on there. So something is being sort of like restoked. And I do think it is really fascinating that the Obamas just signed this deal with Netflix this point, two years out from an election. Right, like, right, right. Right. It's going to be like anti-Trump. It's going to like, Mich be like Michelle and Oprah. Yeah, it's going to be anti-Trump documentaries that will morph themselves into, oh, well, maybe we should run for president. And, we, and it, just the question to me, I think you're right. So what you basically said to me is you think that they're going to run on a ticket together. Oh, and hell my, yeah. I, I, right? And so like, it'll be interesting to see which one runs, which, who's the president and who's the vice president, right? Right. Oh, that's <laughs> true. It's true. Right? But like, no, I mean, obviously, like, and you were talking to me about how the cute thing over, not, um, that Oprah does where she's like, well, they, they, everybody wants me to maybe, you know what I mean? Like, I don't really want to, but everyone wants right. me to. And then I, there's been a lot of people, you know, in the more conspiratorial realm who've been talking for a long time about the fact that Michelle Obama would eventually, you know, run for president or whatever. And, um, you know, uh, I think that, so that's been kind of talk up, but I do think 
it's an interesting, I mean, I wonder if we're just, sometimes if we're just going to only have celebrities as presidents from now on. I that, think so. I think so. Into, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we're totally being played. I mean, it started with Reagan, which is kind of when, if you go, you know, go back to where like Bush was head of the CIA and you kind of follow the breadcrumbs back mm -hmm. to like the whole PNAC thing, like, Reagan was an integral part of that. So yes, I do think they're all going to be actors and I think we're completely being played by the left. And whether it's like, I, I heard Michelle on the Oprah thing and she's like, oh my God, that's ridiculous. And I, I totally believed it. I was like, yes, that is ridiculous. It's obviously not her path. And the second I saw this where she was calling for women to mm -hmm. hate on mm -hmm. Trump voters, I'm like, she's running. I right. like, I like, I, I, why else? What is, what is this about right now? Divide, right. divide, divide, divide. How, and what was so weird on that thread was seeing how like lovingly and kindly I thought both you and I responded to the mm -hmm. sexual assault woman yeah. and how she doubled down on like wanting to fight with us. And it was so weird as far as like, this is a personal thread. We're personal friends. This isn't like a larger do you know what I'm saying? Like, you're yeah. not talking to a nation of strangers, like, like, and we were trying to offer some like kindness and support and she was just like outer limits. Yeah. <laughs> not, yeah. Not grounded into the, the friendly conversation that we were having. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, I, I mean, both, I, I, I felt, I, I expressed my compassion for her experiences and whatever. And, and then yeah. just said, you know, but this, but look at this and, yeah, but I think well, some people just shut off there real quickly. I also wanted to say that I do think it's super interesting that they've chosen Netflix as the venue to, to, to run their campaign on, obviously, right, on a certain right. level. Because one of the things that's been going on is it's become very, very clear that people do not take the mainstream media or the mainstream news seriously anymore. And people are really much more interested in binge watching shit on Netflix and people right. are starting to learn because, you know, they, they understand that there has been a shift where people are being like, oh, they're telling us more truth in these series on Netflix and shit like that than they are on the TV. So people right. are actually getting their information even from, um, you know, fiction, fiction uh, shows that are on Netflix. And they know that that's where the people who, who, you know, who are like starting to step outside the box, that's where their focus is, is on Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu and stuff like that. Nobody's watching the TV anymore. So... I mean, this is a perfect place for them to sort of run this through. And, and, you know, even even yeah. if people are not interested, they're gonna watch because it's there. You well, know and I mean? people, but and but people weirdly love the Obamas. Like, there's no like what actually happened during his presidency is so irrelevant compared to like this weird, inexplicable uh, loyalty people have to them. Yep. <laughs> it is, well, I mean, that, and that's, that's what he was chosen for. That's that, well, that was a puppet that they knew that he was the perfect puppet to play the role. That they needed. It's always like that. Like you get a person who's like super likable and super PC and everyone thinks he's a great guy and you get him to usher in like the absolutely most tyrannical shit you've ever heard of. And then you get a guy who's like, clearly like comes off as like more authoritarian and you somehow blame all the shit that the guy who wasn't authoritarian did on him. Yeah. It's you nuts. I mean? Yeah. It's nuts. So, it's nuts. Yeah. Yeah, yep. totally. All right. So like, let's, let's, let's just wind this over. Let's like, we're getting kind of close to the end here, but I wanted to talk a little bit about that um, Joe Rogan podcast recently with Candace Owens. It's come up a couple of times here and <clears throat> just the, uh, they had an interesting, their whole show is interesting. People should watch it. You had some points that about it that, you know, you already brought up in terms of her sort of becoming watered down as she becomes part of this group of conservatives that are well known. I don't Water, I mean, I know I did say watered down, and I don't know that that necessarily applies to her, but I certainly seen her, I'm watching her becoming more identified as a conservative, which is interesting as someone who had always, not always, because she hasn't been around that long, but who had previously identified as being independent. She does seem to be allying herself more and more on the right. She does seem to be sort of parroting a lot of their behaviors. Yeah. Um, in her dis like the otherizing and the disdain for people with different points of view and, and her, like she's, it, I, granted her, her videos before are, are more just like what she chooses to talk about, but also yeah. seeming weirdly more like allied with religion. Mm -hmm. Um, well, that, she's spending, she's spending a lot of time with hanging out with that guy, Charlie Kirk, who runs Turning Point USA, which she works for. Yeah. And he's very much that way. Like, you know, when he's not talking about politics, he's talking about God. So she's being yeah. influenced by the people she's spending time with. Um, for sure. I, I actually thought the really interesting 
part of this podcast was watching the exchange between Joe and Candace about climate change. Yeah, so I love that because you you texted me about it and I was like, oh, I haven't got, I was listening to it like right then. I'm like, I haven't gotten to that part yet. Let's hold off or maybe you and I, you and I were talking about it. Um, and I was surprised because you'd given me warning and always, it's so funny because I always feel a little bit protective of Joe Rogan in mm -hmm. light of your particular opinion about him. Mm -hmm. But I was surprised where it was like, Oh yeah, he totally lost his shit. Mm -hmm. um, but what I loved about it, and which I think is so important, is that it showed me like we all have our trigger issues. It, it mm -hmm. goes back to like your frustration with the the vegan feminists. It's like, <laughs> well, for as much unidentifying, like you, I'll speak for myself, as much unidentifying as I've done and strive to do, like I still identify as an Aquarius, you know, like that's one ish, one place where like, I'm still staunchly identified. And I also know that I'm getting in my way there. Yeah. So we all have those issues that like set us off. And I love that Joe Rogan is generally pretty objective and pretty neutral and pretty, pretty even keel. And I liked hearing him lost, lose his shit because it he lost his me, shit. Yeah. He lost, like he really lost it. And she held the conversation down. Um, but it was interesting. It's like, okay, obviously this is one of his issues. This is an area where like, and I know he's in his own, I don't know. It, I guess that he's someone who works on himself. I know you have different, you know, you might I, have I, I think he works on himself. I, I, I don't dislike Joe Rogan and I do think he works on himself, but I think he has some certain personality characteristics that have been exploited by certain kinds of, by certain factions that are getting him to perform a role that I don't know is one of his own idea. Um, right. And it comes, you know, but, and this, and, and, and this is sort of one of them. And I thought she did a really good job at not letting him do that. I loved when she said to him, I feel like you're getting, trying to get me to say something that I don't actually believe. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Like he was saying like, you don't have a right to have an opinion even. And I liked, and I also liked that she stuck to her feminine. She's like my intuition. Like this is from what I've seen, this is how it feels to me. But I liked seeing him lose it because it's like, I, I do feel like in this climate, like someone will have a freak out or say something stupid and all of a sudden we completely X them out in their mm -hmm. workplace. And it's like, you know, like Peterson, I like a lot of what he has to say. I don't like some of what he has to say in general. I'd rather he has a platform and I'd rather he keep talking because I think his good really outweighs the stuff that I don't drive with. And I liked seeing that with Joe. And similarly, um, I also liked how in that, because there was sort of like a meta example of this when she was talking about the Washington Post is pure crap. And he was kind, he was defending it. Like, oh, mm -hmm. they have some good stuff. And she's like, what was the last good thing you read? And he couldn't remember it. And so they're like, let's just pick an article at random. And three sentences in, he was reading it. They were like, and, you know, so-and-so B rightly apologized for blah, blah, blah. And he was like, wait a minute, that's not okay that they said that. And I love that, like, he was defending them. And within, like, 30 seconds of going down this rabbit hole, it was so obvious right. that the Washington Post sucked well, shit. Yeah, yeah, no, I just going back a little bit, I too thought it was interesting. I think it was a healthy practice to see him get triggered because a lot of people have gotten triggered on his show and it's been, like, embarrassing for them. You know what I mean? And so this was good to show, like, anyone, it can happen. But this weird thing that was happening, the conversation, because it, it became one of those circular conversations, like, sometime he gets into with Eddie Bravo about conspiracy stuff or whatever. Like, but this idea, like, he couldn't accept that she felt different. She didn't need him to agree with her, but he really needed her to agree with him. And it he, wasn't even agree with him. It was like she wasn't allowed to have an opinion until she did her research and came to his opinion. It was like, well, it also felt like he was saying that, like, well, because you're a public person, you have to have this opinion because well, all the scientists agree on it. I, I have to say, I, I, I did sort of agree. I mean, she, look, she, she he, he interviews who he wants to interview based on the topics that he's interested in. Maybe climate change isn't something she's interested in. I did think he had a point in that she has a big platform and a lot of people are listening to her. Right. And given this is an area that she is wielding a strong opinion, mm -hmm. but doesn't have any facts at the ready. It's kind of like, look, if I'm on your show and I'm talking about cryptocurrency and I don't have the right 
languaging in place. It's okay, you can give me a pass because I'm not a podcast host. You have a different responsibility when you're interviewing your guests to do some research, to have a little bit more information at the ready. Do you know right. what I'm saying? I'm not saying he was right. I'm not, I'm not right. saying that I agree with him, but he said it and I was like, it's true. She does have a big platform. A lot of people are listening to her. If she is going to have such a strong opinion, it but might she, be helpful. She was very clear that. on the fact that it was an opinion. She talked about the fact that she really only spent one night going down the rabbit hole. So she yeah. didn't say that, like, and she also said, I, I wouldn't stand, like, I wouldn't sell, I wouldn't sell stock on this, right? This is just my feeling, my intuition. But she also, you know, basically said, you know, that this is just like, you know, she, she's, this is a belief. She was like saying, I don't believe in it. She wasn't saying that I know that it's not true. Right. Totally. It was very clear. And, 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 you know, like just this, the thing that I, that I was watching was, and this goes to our, actually the, the larger topic of our whole conversation to this day is that like, it has to be okay to disagree. Like we yeah. have, to, that's the whole, that's, that's actually like where we're in the most danger of losing free speech is because these people who can't accept disagreement, like I'm yeah. like right now I'm super like for the last several, several months, I've been super more appreciating, like having conversations with people I disagree with than ones I agree with. If they can, we can have them respectfully. Like there's really yeah. more to be, there's so much to learn and it's actually, it's a sign of human maturity and intelligence and compassion and all of this kind of stuff. People should be able to passionately argue about something and then hug it out and be like, I love you and it's cool, that's your opinion, this is mine. And, yeah. and this idea that like, you, if we're gonna be friends, you have to believe what I believe or you have to, yeah. you have to think like, it's very, um, th this is how like, they're not gonna need the government to enforce censorship. The people, the minions are gonna do it for them if we keep up this kind of for concept. Sure. Yeah. For sure, and I, I, I completely agree with you. And I, I think my sense of the thing with Joe is kind of like what the New York Times is doing with Peterson or Pizzagate or, and it's like everyone thinks they're a little bit smarter than the, the opposing party right. and that they know better. And we all have these, this apocalyptic fear running through us because everything is so like orange alert, 11th hour freaky. So, you know, you, you have the New York Times fucking with the news because they think they're gonna save the world. And I think like my guess is part of what was going, like Joe's got this climate crisis. He has kids, right? Which is a whole different orientation. And he had that apocalyptic, like he lost his shit. He wasn't grounded. His nervous right. system was out of balance. Yeah. And, and then it goes into like, you know, the larger implications of people are stupid and they believe they're celebrities. And Candace Owens is quickly becoming a celebrity. I'm sure she has a huge following of, of people who blind, and that's the problem is we live in a culture where people blindly believe. So I think Joe was panicking of like, well, how many young women are gonna hear you say that and blindly swallow it? Which is like a fair concern, but not, not okay to tell him that she has to change her opinion. But also, but also the same thing goes for Joe. Like Joe doesn't actually know that much about all these different things. And lots of people believe things because Joe says them, right? Of course. And Joe's always saying things like, well, scientists agree. Well, that's not completely true. There's lots of scientists who've lost their jobs, lost their funding, lost their careers because they actually disagreed and they don't get any attention, even though they were just as qualified as, science, as these other scientists who sort of agree. So the same thing can go both ways. And it's just like, to me, the, like, the shining, her shining moment in that whole thing is she maintained her respectful ability to disagree and he did not. He just, totally. he did not. And, and, and um, you know, that, like, that, was, that was cool. You know what I mean? Like that was, that, that was cool to see that. Uh, I mean, it would have been cooler if they could have had a disagreement and had it be like him not lose his shit on a certain level. But I think the exercise was healthy for everyone to see how this happens and what's going on. And, and also, he was a little bit trying to ha handle her, trying to manipulate her. And, and it was very obvious. I think he was, but I don't, I, I mean, I think it was in, yes, I do think that he was. And I think that he does, he can do that. You know, like yeah. he's a 50 year old dude with daughters. So I've seen him do that before. Right. Um, but I think this is what we're up against, circling back to what you were talking about earlier with the identification is like, yeah. we are not enlightened. Everyone's identified 
everyone has shadows and everyone has blind spots. Yep. And right now everything's so heightened that we're going to keep crashing into one another's. Um, and I hope that those aren't like conversation breakers. Like yeah. she rocked that because she was able to hold the conversation down and that was yeah. great. And they got to stay in it. And it's, I mean, I, I, I don't know how this is going to go because it seems to be getting more and more alarming, but like, we're, we're not going to be seeing people who don't have their triggers and who are wholly objective. Yeah. Like that's just not realistic. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, I agree. So, wow, we just burned through a whole lot of stuff there. And we like, I think we're kind of coming to the end here. And, you know, I think that like, you know, when we first talked about doing this, the idea being to sort of <laughs> challenge the sort of mainstream narrative. And I think we are, we're doing it here, but I also like this conversation about the energetics around all of it and sort of our parts in that and the way people are sort of responding to, it's not just about the media, but the way people are really responding and how each of us can sort of um, take some responsibility for the way we're communicating with people about the stuff that we see going on. Yeah, I mean, that's the most interesting conversation for me is like, like even on the, the threads that you and I have been on is like seeing where I'm triggered, seeing, you know, like, like, you know, if, if Joe and I were friends, it would be like, okay, the climate, the climate change conversation is showing you something, some shadow about yourself that's inviting some attention. So what is that? But the reason why I got all excited was because the last thing that I wanted to, to point to is like it does seem right now everyone's freaking out about what are we going to do about this situation like it's it, it, it does seem to be reaching some like crisis crescendo and in that um joe rogan candace owens conversation they both talked about amazon being a problem and ah. how they both um still knowing that use Amazon Prime all the time. And there was this praise for it. Um, and I was telling you at the start of this conversation how I signed up for Amazon Prime like a month ago and notice how it's just this portal to consumption. And all of a sudden, like I'm oriented towards shopping and, and consuming in a way that I haven't been. And how given that like there's all this Michigas and theater and rigmarole that's trying to make it seem like Trump voters are the issue, women are the issue, men are the issue like these are the people we should be hating on and what should we do about it and, right. the, and the only thing is like you know this is where i go back to very bernie it's like no no no. it's like americans as one unified all of us and fucking oligarchy and the corporations and this amazon and all these people who we're giving our money and our attention and our privacy to and and we cannot do this much longer. Like we're really going to have to take a stand and pull our support out of these corporations who do not have our best interests in mind on any level whatsoever. Isn't so the point here being that like when we talk about what we're gonna do about things, instead of arguing with each other, everybody should stop paying for their own enslavement, right? Um, that, well, I that. think the whole like that, well, that's been my big thing. But it's easier to fight with each other, right? It's it's a lot more inconvenient to get off Amazon and to get off Google. <laughs> I, like, I've been completely going through this thing where like my phone is out of room and it's not actually hardly functioning anymore. Like I can't get emails on it. I can't do this, that, or the other thing. But like, I don't know how many more times I want to buy a device that is, you know, where I'm paying for my own surveillance and my own enslavement and whatever. I'm sure eventually I'll give in and whatever, but right now I'm feeling that, you know, that little protest. And, you know, what you and I were talking about was like, you know, maybe if, if there's things you want to do something about, like rather than stand in the street and scream or fight with each other about them, just like be like, no, I'm not paying for that. And I think, I don't, don't you find it fascinating and you, you being the, the language person and whatever, that the, right now they just tell us exactly what they are and what they're doing. They called it Amazon, right? Like we're gonna fucking eat the whole world. Like, you know, we're gonna be this giant, it was the only thing that would be more, um, more like uh, truthful or sinister or whatever is if they called it Goliath, right? <laughs> like, Isn't Amazon a world eater? I thought yeah. Amazon were like powerful women warriors. Well, I mean, so I think, I think, I think when I think of Amazon, I think of like something that's like really big. Like, I, yeah, like the do you think of Amazon woman, like Amazon ladies, I know what you're talking about. Right. Isn't the term Amazon just about like, isn't it about just being this like giant kind of. I mean, I can look it up. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I have um, it wrong. I mean, I know it's a forest, <laughs> a pretty big it's, forest. It's a big thing. It's a big thing that sort of like overtakes everything else around it, right? 
and, and, a and member look of a legendary race of female warriors. There we go. You're, you're right, and I'm wrong. Hey. <laughs> why? Why? But is, why do I think that it's just the big thing? Like, I guess I'm just in like, Middle English. It means without a breast. Okay, so I'm completely wrong. Why is it that I? Why in my head was I thinking that it was just like when I think of it, I think of it as just like this giant, ever expanding thing. I don't know. It gets bigger and bigger. Like I, I guess that's interesting. So I have a complete. <laughs> Right? But you know what? But this is a great reason why it's so important that we define our terms. Because yeah. you and I could have just gotten in a big dumb fight about what Amazon means when we just have like different, you know, like are we even talking about the same thing? Like the right. whole Jordan yeah. Peterson breakdown yeah. where like people Perfect. are yeah. taking issue but they don't understand what he's even talking about. Yeah. So I don't know why I thought that, but that, that it actually makes it even more interesting that he's named it after a wild woman warrior. So like, you know, like think about that right like what did, what did you just say the definition was well uh hang on it was a member of the legendary race of female warriors believed by the ancient greeks to exist in scythia or elsewhere on the edge of the known world oh i love on the edge of the known world that's i, yeah, I like that too um I mean, we know there's that whole like raping of the female goddesses with like Isis and Sophia and like how the, you know, that's all being malign. And I could maybe see a tangent there, but yeah. like I haven't thought it through, so I'm not going to commit yeah. let's to it. Let's not go there. But I, that, thought, that thought just occurred to me. I was thinking of it as just as like this giant thing that just consumes everything. And, and that's actually what happened is that it had, what's happening with Amazon is that it's just kind of, you know, consuming everything and everybody's going along with it when like, because it's convenient and we love our convenience. And like, we're, we're going to have to give that up. And I, I yes. Yes. think it's going to be sooner than later that we would be wise to make that choice. <laughs> I don't have Amazon Prime. So when, uh, on the occasion that I need to use Amazon, I just pay the extra. And that's sort of like reminding me not to like get into that whole thing and, and whatnot. But um, I've resisted that one. So, but I, I, I have other shit that I've completely, you know, I still fucking have Netflix and you know what I mean? <laughs> so. Right, right. All right, guys. So this has been awesome. Danny, any last parting words? Where can people find your work? Uh, people can find me on dannycats.com and they can click through all the various tributaries from there. And they can follow me on Instagram, something.danny. And, and yeah, on Patreon. That, yeah, and on Patreon. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Patreon, patreon.com uh, forward slash Danny Katz. Okay, cool. All right, so we will be back hopefully sooner rather than later with another round of whatever this was. <laughs> <laughs> and um, everybody have a good evening and we'll see you next time. Take care. All right.